lost because we have earned them. It illustrates a great exemption America has created from the risk of coveting our neighbor's goods. If we see something our neighbor has that attracts us, we have the ability, the advantage, to go out and earn a similar thing for ourselves. It is our chance to gain what we want and dispense with our money as we please. At least that is how it should be in an America that has stood as a symbol of freedom and prosperity for centuries. We are accused in the modern day of having become a consumerist society. While there are grains of truth to this, to be found in the uh, greed that stains our free market principles from the hands of some unscrupulous individuals, people who make that argument have forgotten or ignored the historical relevance of what we own. Property was a major motivator for the American Revolution to begin with, if you think about it. In the old world, status and the very worth of a person were determined by his or her estates, wealth, and the opulence with which he or she dispensed it. And all of this was as hereditary as the power that ran government. Our forefathers, represented by the Continental Congress, made up of wealthy and poor men alike, realized the injustice of a noble class holding in their hands the access to fortune and to the advantage of fortune itself. They said that a man's worth was not determined by his property, by his hereditary, by his heredity rather. It was determined instead by his efforts, his initiative, and his insight. And they also said that a man, every man, was equal under the law and in the eyes of God who created him. They resolved that the taxation of the British government without freely elect elected representation was unjust exploitation and created a nation that valued the importance of a man earning his keep and being responsible for himself, his family, and his earnings with a minimal amount of feeding government coffers. This could serve a dual purpose, keep money in the pockets of the people who earned it and keep the government necessarily small. Today we have strayed from these values at times. There are men and women in our government who have forgotten that it was intended to be kept small and that its citizens were meant to give as little of their earnings to a central state as possible. They have forgotten that money left in the pockets of Americans is money used to keep the economy strong and that removing it for their own purposes will only breed resentment and public discontent. In forgetting this, they have even forgotten that they are on the payroll of their constituents and that they are thus accountable. They have forgotten that money is a real thing, not just a figure in some banker's wallet, and it is not very hard to see why. They've spent it hand over fist, demanding more of it from their sometimes unwilling benefactors, and thrown it at more and more projects unpopular with the people footing the bill. They have taken the hard-earned dollars of Americans and tucked them into the pockets of men whose insatiable greed brought down the markets of the wealthiest nation in the world so that these men could continue to fail time and time again with impunity. What have they to fear, after all, if they, if they know that the government will always pay for their mistakes with other people's money? If this money never left the pockets of Americans in the first place, these men would have been allowed to fail, and the principles of capitalism founded in those principles of private property would have been maintained. A hemorrhage of money can never replace the choices of responsible consumers. So perhaps the reality is that a nation of people earning their keep and spending it on what they want really isn't such a bad thing after all. Our property is also a fail-safe against tyranny, a standing assurance that we are, at our cores, a good people. We are routinely admonished by foreign nations about our supposed greed, our indifference, our unwillingness to share. This, they reason, is why it is right for our government to impose upon us more and more taxes, make us do the right thing. Well, the figures simply tell a different story. In the past three years alone, unbeknownst to most of the American citizens uh, who are watching the international media and seeing what other foreign nations have said about our charity, Private citizens of the United States, in the last three years alone, at the behest not of their government, but of their consciences, have donated over $1.4 trillion to international charity and relief efforts. $1.4 trillion. Not at the government's command, but because it's the right thing to do. Let not socialist nations whose governments have abridged the freedoms of their people accuse us of indifference. It is the generous hands of the American people and not of our government that have cradled the starving, the sickly, the catastrophe-ridden nations all over the world. 
and extended a helping hand to our fellow human beings. It is irrefutable evidence that if left to our own ends, our intentions are good and we will do good. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We need only be proud of our countrymen and the dignified examples they have shown to the world. That goodwill, that natural compulsion to do the right thing is the ultimate defense for the maintenance of our rights to our property. If we are to disregard the Constitution and simply know the reason why, there it is. We are responsible at our best, and at our worst, we learn from our mistakes. Utopian prospects are all very nice to think about and to discuss, not unlike fairy tales. But the true scholar of government is also a scholar of humanity and accepts two realities. One, that it is the natural state of every man, woman, and child to wish to live free and two, that all people respond to incentive. It is simply reality. We have provided the opportunity to work and to prosper. That is a basic American message. It has been since the founding of this country. Equally vital is ensuring that the fruits of the labors of honest people are not encroached upon by greater forces and that we trust the provably good citizens of the United States of America enough to allow them what is theirs. It is a noble and a worthwhile trust and they have never disappointed us once. Our liberty is our providence, as are our duly earned goods, our finances. These represent our liberty. To maintain them is to maintain our freedom, and we have earned that too.